All right, this next video will cover some topics of east-west exchange in China and Japan. We'll start off with China and look at the Qing dynasty, and then we will move on to Japan. Obviously, what we're seeing here is a woodblock print from the Yukioe tradition in Japan. Um, it's known commonly as the Great Wave, and it's part of a series of views of Mount Fuji. And we'll talk about it in more detail in a few minutes. But these artworks were very influential for European artists, so we'll be thinking about that exchange in the lecture today. But starting off with China, so what we just saw was Japanese, but starting off with China, we're talking about the Qing Dynasty, the dynasty that comes after the Ming. The Qing is another one of these examples of what's considered to be a foreign dynasty. So we'd seen with the Yuan, uh, a dynasty that was ruled by the Mongols and so was not always accepted by those in China. With the Qing Dynasty, it's a dynasty ruled by the Manchus, which were a semi-nomadic people from the northeast, from the northeast of the Great Wall. Um, they conquered the crumbling Ming state and established their own Qing Dynasty, Qing meaning pure, so obviously picking uh, a name to reflect positive aspects. It's the last imperial dynasty in China, so in 1912, the last emperor Puyi would abdicate and China would then move into becoming a republic and then finally into the People's Republic, and we'll talk about that in a later video. So the map that you see on the left is the Qing Dynasty in 1890, which shows the extent of the Qing Dynasty roughly similar to China today. So an example of this east-west exchange would be a favored artist among the Qing emperors whose name was Giuseppe Castiglione. Uh, from that name, I think you can clearly tell that he was not Chinese. He was from Italy, uh, and he went by the Chinese name Lang Shining. And this is a hand scroll that was created around the time of the inauguration of the Chonglong Emperor, who was an incredibly important emperor who ruled for most of the 18th century. His reign went from 1735 to 1796, so a very, very extensive, very long reign. Um, this is called the Inauguration Portraits of the Chonglong Emperor, his Empress, and the Eleven Imperial Consorts, or mind picture of a well-governed and tranquil reign. We are looking at a detail, so we're just seeing this section here. Remember, of course, I know I've told you this a million times, but you read hand scrolls from right to left, and so you would start over here. You would encounter um, the cinnabar seals. You would encounter any decoration at the start of the scroll. Then you would see the young Chonglong Emperor with the sense that you're starting off a great new uh, imperial rule, then you encounter the empress, and then moving on to his consorts. So the emperor had his empresses, he had uh, consorts of various levels, and then on to concubines. So remember that these rulers often had you know, multiple kind of wives or consorts. This was a way to create diplomatic ties and also a way to ensure uh, an heir to the em for the empire, an heir to become the next emperor. So clearly what we're seeing here is a, a moment where we're supposed to be sure that we're entering into a tranquil reign. We also see that he's very young and has a great reign ahead of him, looks very healthy. And of course he will go on to reign for uh, decades and decades into the latter part of the 18th century. Uh, it's ink and color on silk. You can see the beautiful clothes that they're wearing. So we're going to see an example of one of these robes in just a second. But you can see that in the winter time, they were often lined with fur, various types of luxurious fur. Um, they were woven this kind of tapestry weave that would take a very, very long time to create um, by hand. And we do see some distinct styles with the robes of the Qing Dynasty, which I'll discuss in a little more detail in the in the next slides. But you can see that with the art of Giuseppe Castiglione, uh, he was bringing a greater naturalism to the representation of the human form. That was something that the Qing emperors appreciated, that they looked all the more real, uh, all the more present. So there were certain elements of Western painting that they did appreciate and that Castiglione was able to introduce into the Chinese court. If we look at the Chonglong Emperor in old age, so clearly we can see that he did live to be uh, an older emperor and he lived to be 87, you can see that the robes were heavily decorated with dragons, which we've talked about before. Again, fur lining to keep warm in the winter. Beijing is cold in the winter. Um, you can see that they had these kind of heavy cuffs around the, the hands. And some people suggest that this 
um, connects back to traditions of how you would want your robe to cover your hand to keep your hands warm, kind of like gloves, especially if you were a group that rode horseback, which the Manchus did, and so this was a way to protect and cover the hands. You can also see how the robes would often be adorned with jewelry or other types of symbols. You could um, attach different symbols from the belt or different objects from the belt. You can see that he's also in his dragon throne. So you'd see this kind of windiness of the dragon throne off to the side. And so um, that reinforcement of the dragon over and over again, this figure that can help to control the weather, that can move between the heavens and the earth. And again, the emperor as the son of heaven, it makes a lot of sense to connect to that dragon. So we were talking about how in China they were starting to really appreciate the style of Lang Shining or Giuseppe Castiglione in his Italian name and so what they appreciated was this greater naturalism, this interest in the human form, this idea of making the emperor look truly present, um, this idea of really making the human form very prominent rather than emphasizing only the natural world, really bringing the, the human form into a greater presence. But there was something that they really didn't like about Western art, and this, that was that heavy use of modeling. So if we compare Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, by Titian, a Venetian artist who worked in the 16th century, to Castiglione's representation of the Chonglong Emperor on horseback, you can see that heavy use of modeling in Titian's version. version. And by modeling, I mean the heavy use of shadows. So using shadows to make the figures look more dimensional, because there was always this goal in European art of how do we make these figures look more sculptural and more dimensional and there's always this heavy use of modeling in order to bring those figures forward. And the Chinese thought that that looked really dirty and there was this idea of creating an image of harmony and purity. If you remember the Qing dynasty means pure. And so you have this idea of brightness and clarity in the images of the Chenglong Emperor. So I just think that's an important contrast between the two. If we move on to that portrait of the elderly Chonglong Emperor, you can see, by, and this is by an artist in Castiglione's style, not by Castiglione himself, you can see again those similarities between East and West when we look at the Chonglong Emperor, the elderly Chonglong Emperor, compared to Henry VIII from the 16th century by Hans Holbein, the younger. Um, you can see that both figures are really filling the composition. They look powerful. They have um, dec a lot of decoration on their bodies, uh, a lot of indication of power and royalty. However, uh, you definitely have that reduction in modeling on the Chonglong Emperor and also that idea of brightness and purity that's reinforced in the Chonglong Emperor's portrait. So we were talking about the importance of robes and the dragon robes and what the emperors are wearing and we did mention this in a previous or I did mention this in a previous video as well and there were some modifications depending on the dynasty so we tend to see we tended to see more loose robes in the Ming dynasty and then they become a little bit more um, kind of contained and allowing for more easy movement during the Qing dynasty so there's different theories as to why this was whether it was coming down from traditions from the Manchus or whether it was just a a deliberate shift because they had moved into a new dynasty we're not a hundred percent sure um, but there is some consistent symbolism so this idea of the emperor at center the neck is called the gate of heaven so again he's the son of heaven you have this cloud filled sky filled with these dragons so three dragons on the back three dragons on the front so three on the front, three on the back, two on the shoulders, and then the emperor's head is the ninth dragon. And I think I said in a previous video that he was the tenth dragon. It's definitely the ninth. So this idea that he's always kind of just one slightly below heaven, one slightly below the perfection of heaven. Um, so again, that cloud-filled sky filled with dragons, eight dragons on the robe, the emperor's head is the ninth dragon. You have these prism-shaped rocks creating those cardinal points north, south, east, and west. Then you have what's called the Li Shui border, leading us to this universal ocean. So he's just emerging out of this amazing ocean here with waves crashing against these prism-shaped rocks. During the reign of the Chonglong Emperor, he decided that there should be these 12 symbols that are incorporated into the robes. Um, there have been different theories as to why this kind of outsider dynasty allowed these very traditional 12 symbols, um, but at this point the Chonglong Emperor was 
his power was pretty well established, the Qing dynasty was doing quite well, and so that's probably the reason they started appropriating these traditional Chinese symbols. So symbols include the sun, the moon, the constellations, also a mountain symbolizing the earth. There's what's called a flowery creature or pheasant symbolizing the spring. There's a pair of dragons symbolizing the summer. An axe symbolizes the autumnal equinox, which was also the time when the emperor would order executions. Autumn was a traditional time of death as well. The Fu symbol, which is this symbol, um, you can Google it, Fu, F-U, uh, Sorry. Uh, the winter solstice, uh, which is also connected to the idea of the emperor as the chief judge. So symbols of the elements, there's a symbol of water with the water weed. Libation cups symbolize uh, metal and also temple offerings. Grain symbolizes the element of wood, and it also symbolizes plant life and the emperor's responsibility to feed his people. Remember, the emperor would make sacrifices at the temple of heaven to help ensure a prosperous year and a good harvest. And then a flame symbolizes fire, and then there's also that mountain symbol, which symbolizes earth. So you have the five elements, you have all of the seasons, and then you have symbols of both the heavens and the earth. So the whole the whole robe is really full of uh, symbols and the universality of the emperor, the centrality of the emperor, and his importance to survival for the Chinese. There's just a close-up on some of those dragons, the prism-shaped rocks, and then the water of the universal ocean. The dragon's a really interesting composite creature. There's been some discussion of the different animal elements that are all composed in the dragon, including a camel, a deer, a frog, a rabbit, a tiger. So it's really this kind of composite of powerful beings. The dragon robe that we were looking at previously is from the Daoguang Emperor from the 19th century, and so I'm just showing you a comparison between the robe itself and then the emperor with all of the, the extra accoutrements added, right? So having the belts, also the additional jewelry, the headgear, the kind of cape that he's wearing, um, you can get a full sense of how he would have looked in ceremonial garb. During the Chonglong Emperor, during the Chonglong uh, rule, so going back to the 18th century, there is a greater development in different kinds of porcelain colors. So that's really the contribution to porcelain during this period. We talked about during the Ming, the interest in really perfecting the blue and white porcelain style, although we do see some experimentation with different colors. But during the Qing Dynasty, we see this interest in exploring what are known as enamels, and so this is porcelain painted with colored enamels over a transparent glaze. It does come from that porcelain city, Jing Dejen, which is this city that had a plentiful amount of that wonderful um, kaolin or kaolin clay, that white clay that could create the wonderful porcelain. So this created a wider variety of colors. The pink was a pretty big deal because the way the pink was created, uh, you would take red, the red um, paint or whatever you were decorating with red, and you would add a tiny bit of gold to it and that would create the pink shade. So what we're seeing here is a vase with nine peaches, a peach had a symbolism associated with a long healthy life and also with immortality. Um, so obviously it was a very auspicious symbol but also just the fact that you had this wider variety of colors meant that you could um, create more of this export wear that had a wider wider audience. So especially for Europeans, they often demanded a lot of extra decoration, and so these extra colors were probably highly sought after. Um, remember that the imperial court itself would also commission a lot of porcelain ware, and that would be brought into the imperial household. So I was talking about the enamels, and so enamels just mean that you are going to do a second firing. You're going to do your initial firing at the porcelain high, you know, high firing temperature. And then you're going to do a second firing to fire on these colors because they can't withstand the super high porcelain temperatures. So you can see that part of the enamels have almost fallen have fallen off, and so you have these portions that are no longer there. Um, but just basically, it's an overglaze enamel, almost a glass, a colored glass-like subject. Sub substance that's added onto the surface. Um, but due to this wider range of colors beyond blue, it added you know, broader audience to the porcelain. 
Uh, just in case I, I forgot to say something about this particular robe, just this idea that um, textiles, of course, don't necessarily survive very well over time. And so we do tend to have more textiles from recent dates. I think I mentioned this in a previous video too. Um, but the Qing Dynasty, we have quite a bit of clothing that survives from this period. But you'll notice that the Daoguang Emperor ruled in the 19th century. So we're seeing a robe that's much more recent than even the Chonglong Emperor. So it's it's pretty important and special to have these garments that survive because again textiles don't necessarily survive very well over time not as well as ceramics or things like that all right so moving on to japan for the remainder of the video we'll be thinking about the edo period going from 1615 to 1868 so 1615 to 1868. At the end of the Edo period, the shogunate is abolished and the emperor is restored to power. So we'll see a dramatic shift as we move into the 19th century. And in the next video, we'll be talking about some politics and things like that, or in a later video. So during the Edo period, you see the continuation of the creation of these gold screens. So we talked about these gold screens um, from the previous period, thinking about how they helped to illuminate these very dark castles, these dark spaces, because it was such a warring time in Japan. Um, but I like this particular screen. It is considered a national treasure in Japan. It's a really important set of screens here. Um, obviously, you have that inlaid, or you have these gold squares that are added. Um, and they are created on these rather large screens, and it's by an artist named Tawaraya, so Tatsu, excuse me, um, and it's the thunder and wind god. So you see Rajin, who's the god of lightning, thunder, and storms, and then you see Fujin over here, the god of wind. Um, so what's wonderful about this particular screen is you have this kind of vast area of gold, again, illuminating space, demonstrating wealth, but also the energy that's kind of packed into these two sides. So obviously these gods um, are connected back to Shinto and connected to Japanese mythology, but so you see this enduring quality of Shinto and this interest in nature spirits the, like the kami that are continuing to endure in moving into um, the Edo period. So we see here um, this kind of energy bursting from the sides. You see the musculature, but also the fact that these figures look older. So certain parts of their body look kind of slack and relaxed, and other parts look incredibly muscular. Um, so just the power of these figures, the importance of lightning, thunder, and storms obviously being incredibly powerful, uh, and then of course wind being very powerful. So there's these energetic forces that are entering from either side. The idea of wind blowing the ribbons on this figure here, the idea of lightning and thunder emanating and smoke emanating from this figure, um, Fujin collecting the wind in this drapery that he holds behind him. So there's a wonderful sense of motion. There's also been discussion that Sotatsu um, created a lot of painted fans. So some people have discussed that the shapes of these creatures that are tucked into the corners here are somewhat reminiscent of fan decoration. Just another example of a very famous golden screen, not a key work, um, is a screen irises by Korin and by Ogata Korin. And so you can see this is a pair of six folded screens with color and gold leaf on paper, also from the Edo period. And there's this wonderful kind of flatness to these um, images that will be influential for later Japanese contemporary artists, so please keep these in mind. The flatness of the image, the kind of rhythm as the flowers dance across the screen, um, as they go from being thick to more thin, um, to just kind of beginning to appear from the ground that's represented by the gold in the background. So almost a kind of poetic rhythm as these natural figures are moving across the screen. All right, the main topic for the end of the video is yukioe, these woodblock prints uh, that were very popular from Japan and also were collected quite a bit in Europe. Yukioe just means pictures of the floating world. These tended to be about subjects that were more kind of of the red light district, so you tended to see um, the like kabuki theater, you tend to see courtesans represented. So the this there was a particular district in Edo in Tokyo where some of these actions or activities could take place and where it was permissible. Uh, and so things like courtesans 
Kabuki theater was very popular in this district. Um, we also have a section or a group of ukiyo-e called shunga, which essentially means spring pictures, but they're very sexual. They're very sexual, erotic images. Um, again, very popular today. We see also landscape scenes, scenes of just beautiful women, kind of celebrations of beautiful women, but much more popular culture. Um, this narrative style originated from the Amaki tradition, that was kind of narrative hand scrolls that we've seen previously. There are scenes of entertainment and beautiful women, as I mentioned. There were millions of prints produced from the 17th to the 19th century. And as I mentioned, they were very, very popular in Europe and very influential. So here I'm showing you a work of the courtesan by Kisai Eason um, from the 1820s. And courtesans, there were certain ways that they would tie their garments and extra adornments that they would wear that would make them distinct from other Japanese women. One of the most famous examples of shunga, these spring pictures that were often very sexual, or that were very sexual, very erotic, um, is by Utamaro. This is called Couple in an Upstairs Room from a series of images from the poem of the pillow. This is from the late 18th century. And so these woodblock prints, you essentially would take different blocks uh, add different colors to them and create this kind of complete image. They, it was quite time consuming in some cases. There are many videos on YouTube where you can watch people making these prints and so you can watch these different stages of laying down, you know, a patterned portion, different patterns, different colors to create these unified images. Um, so Utamaro's work is a, this very intimate scene where in the the upstairs room of a tea house. You can see the branches of a tree um, from outside the opening of the room. You can see the man here. Um, often people will point out that you can just see his eyes staring into the woman's eye here. You can just see a hand on her shoulder. Her garment is falling away. She's reaching towards his face. You can see um, just a little bit of her bottom here. You can see lots of folds and crevices alluding to sexual activity. And then you have a little inscription added on the fan, which says its beak caught firmly in the clamshell. The snipe cannot fly away on an autumn evening. So again, nice sexual message there. Uh, so there's all different discussions as to what shunga means and what it was used for. Um, some scholars suggest that it was just for private fantasies, for kind of private moments um, with a sexual image. There have been various myths put forward that maybe they were used for sex education. This is probably not correct. And then other people have suggested maybe they were supposed to kind of ward off evil, ward off fire, kind of an apotropaic function, um, which we've seen in other cultures, how they use some sexual imagery, but we don't really think it's the case here. And then some people have suggested that warriors or soldiers would put them in their helmets or keep them with them during battle, again, to ward off evil. Probably not. Um, most likely, again, these were kind of private images that people could enjoy on their own, uh, although the purpose is still discussed and still debated. One of the most famous images in all of Japanese art, probably one that you're familiar with, is called the Great Wave of Kanagawa, um, most commonly just called the Great Wave. It's part of a series of 36 views of Mount Fuji. You can just see Mount Fuji featured here in the background. I often ask, you know, why is this the, the image that gets so much attention? I think it's pretty understandable. It was widely copied, so they made many, many copies of it. So again, with prints, you can make multiple impressions, multiple copies, and that's why millions of these yukioi were available around this time. And so this one was very common. If you ever go to an exhibit of yukioi at a museum, most likely this will be on exhibit because any most museums with a Japanese collection will have a copy of this particular print, will have an impression of this print by Hokusai. So you see the name here. So anyways, it also, I mean, I think ideas of Japan, the idea of Mount Fuji, that's something that a lot of people connect to. So you have Mount Fuji here in the background. The idea of waves, the power of water, obviously Jap Jap Japan is um, a series of islands and has often been at the mercy of the ocean and so you see just the power of nature and the power of the waves and we could even connect this back to the kind of kami that we were seeing previously with the thunder and wind god again the importance of the natural world in japan so we clearly see that here 
Many people don't notice the three boats that are incorporated into the scene, so you see them here. Just the idea that the wave is about to fall on them, so you have this particular moment of drama as well. Um, people have also noticed that the spray from the wave is somewhat similar to the snow that's resting on Mount Fuji in this particular uh, winter or kind of cold moment here. So as I mentioned, there are 36 views. So I just wanted to show you one other view, a view from a temple where we're seeing the ornate roof. And then you can also see uh, the clouds that frame Mount Fuji, a kite, and um, again, landscape scenes were quite common for Yuki Oe as well. So I did discuss that uh, there was a lot of influence from these images going to Europe and influencing European artists. So Mary Cassatt is one example. Vincent van Gogh is another. So I just wanted to show you a painting that he created after a sudden evening shower by Hiroshige. So you see that shower here where you see individuals on a bridge and the rain is coming down quite ferociously. Again, a nice study of nature and the natural world. This dates to the mid 19th century. Century. Vincent van Gogh doesn't create a print of this, so Hiroshige is, is a print and could be created in multiples. Vincent van Gogh creates a unique painting where he's using his bold colors. So the Europeans tended to like the colors that were selected, the fact that it tended to be landscapes or city scenes, those studies of beautiful women, all of those were really popular amongst Impressionists and Post-Impressionists, so just the subjects were really striking for them. Some of the patterning that they saw was really interesting for uh, European artists, so all of that was interesting to them. There also was kind of a craze for Japanese culture around this time, so that's important to mention as well. So Vincent van Gogh uh, imitated calligraphy that he found on other prints. He really tried to get that effect of the instance of rain and that moment of rain, which was something interesting to Impressionist and Post-Impressionist, which Vincent van Gogh was a Post-Impressionist. So this kind of moment of the natural world is something he's trying to capture. And so you can see the connection between the two very obviously. Here you can see an example where in a popular, um, a popular journal, you have this idea or this spreading of the images of Yukioe, how it's coming in to be reproduced in journals and in popular publications. And then again, Vincent van Gogh picks this up and represents a courtesan framed with a kind of um, garden and pond in the background. So connecting to the idea of the lotus, which we often see in Asian art. And then here he has a portrait of Pierre Tanguy, who was the owner of a shop of art supplies. Uh, and so Vincent van Gogh created a portrait of him with many of his versions of Yukioe it created in painted form in the background. So I hope this has been informative in terms of East and West exchange in China and Japan and you've learned a little bit about prints and costume and portraiture uh, and we will move on next to uh, Japanese gardens.